next slide, please. Good morning. Good morning, Your Holiness. Today, I'm privileged on behalf of the con Conference Organizing Committee to welcome His Holiness the 14th Dalai Lama, our keynote speakers, who has compassionately accepted our invitation to grace this online event to give an inaugural address followed by a Q&A session. It is also my pleasure to now welcome our opening remarks guest speakers, the most venerable Bixu Jingyao, Chairman of the Buddhist Association of the Republic of China. Our next speaker would be the most venerable Marco Kule Wimala Maha Nakaye Tero, the Chief Fellow of Sri Lanka, Ramana Maha Kinaya of Sri Lanka, and also the most venerable Mah Dhamma Pia, Secretary General of the International Buddhist Confederation of India. And of course, to all our distinguished guests, venerables, and participants who are with us today. This Sanskrit and Pali International Buddhist Conference is initiated by Tibetan Buddhist Center, uh, Singapore, under the guidance of and advice of Mr. Tempa Tsirin, Professor Geshi Nawang Samten, and Geshi Doji Damdu, and is jointly organized by 12 international prestige Buddhist organizations across Asia Pacific and Russia, namely Oswald Buddha Bihara, Singapore, Theravada Buddhist Council of Malaysia, Vajrayana Buddhist Council of Malaysia, Buddha Dasa Indapano Archive Foundation, Thailand, International Network of Engaged Buddhism, Thailand, Sri Lankan Tibetan Buddhist Brotherhood Society, Buddhist Society of Western Australia, Buddhist Union of Kamkia, Russia, and also Department of Buddhist Study, Dharma Drum Institute of Liberal Arts, Taiwan, and Department of Religion and Culture, Shenzhang University, Taiwan. Kata Rajasa Buddhist College, Indonesia. And last but not least, Lamsut Serapling, Korea. As everybody is aware, Buddhism is a religion that is practiced worldwide than what we have believed by at least 500 million people. The basic Buddhist philosophy is interdependence and is practice of nonviolence and compassion. Conviction overriding faith it is also often refers as a science mind and is adaptable to the cultural practice of its follower. Broadly speaking, Buddhists can be categorized into those who follow the Pali tradition and those who ascribe to the Sanskrit tradition. Down the ages, there has been attempt by the Buddhist teachers, scholars, and leaders of the Pali Sanskrit tradition to convene, discuss, and set up international Buddhist organization to appreciate and to rationalize differences in practice of various Buddhist community in this world. The current era of internet communication and fast connectivity brings a unique opportunity for easier access to a virtual Sangha community and an online discussion. And because of this virtual con connectivity, over the next two days, including today, we hear from more than 38 speakers and discussions from 14 countries on the topic of Tishisha and Trishisha, on the three training on the contents of the Tipitaka, Tripitaka. In today's inaugural sessions, followed by our four technical sessions and a validatory session. Today's inaugural session will be moderated by Venerable Mahayano, one of our organizing committee members from Thailand. The technical session won on the team Shila Chika, a Vinaya session exclusively for monastic, will be chaired by Venerable Abbot Tash Genshi Tashitsurin from Sarame Monastic University of India. There will be a concurrent technical session on the theme of Tishika and Trishisha, Theory and Practice of the Lay Audience, chaired by Dr. Daminda Porich from Sri Lanka. Tomorrow, we have two technical sessions, technical session two on the theme of Samadhi Shika, that will be chaired by Venra Dhamma, Dhamma Pala from Malaysia. And uh, tomorrow afternoon, technical session three is on Prana Shika. It will be chaired by Professor Asanga Tila Karate from Sri Lanka. Last but not least, a validatory session that will be chaired by Professor Geshi Nawang Samten, Vice Chancellor, Central Institute of Higher Tibetan Studies, Varanasi, India. We hope that this rich dialogue of this nature will be beneficial in fostering deeper in the Buddhism understanding and greater 
harmony among the holders of different religion and faith, thus contributing to the effort made by His Holiness the Dalai Lama and various great global leaders over the past decades. With this inspiration in, my, in mind, we are motivated to continue to strengthen the model of building trust, progress, and success in the Buddhist intra-faith relation, and thereby sharing this wisdom with the wider interfaith world. And without further ado, I will now hand over to our moderator for today, Venra Mahayano, to start the session. Thank you, Your Holiness. Good morning, Your Holiness, distinguished most venerable distinguished guests. Um, the inaugural session shall begin with three opening remarks from three remarkable Sangha leaders from both traditions. And after the three opening remarks, I would like to humbly invite His Holiness the Dalai Lama to give the inaugural speech, which will be followed by a Q&A session with the audience. And this will conclude our inaugural session this morning. So firstly, I would like to introduce our first opening remarks speaker, most venerable Bhikshu Jin Yong. Most Venerable is the President of the Buddhist Association of the Republic of China and President of Taiwan Conference on Religion and Peace. Venerable had worked extensively on humanitarian issues, disaster relief programs, improving the lives of people in prison, and had received over 30 awards since 1993. So may I invite Most Venerable Bhikshu Jin Yao to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, may I invite most people, Pichu Jin Yao, to please give the opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, from Taiwan. From Taiwan. The president of Buddhist Association of the Republic of China. First of all, I would like to express my thankfulness to Tibetan Buddhist Center of Singapore for inviting me, for inviting me to participate in this meaningful and important international Buddhist conference by the title of the Three Trainings. We have to organize this event online this time due to this pandemic, but I'm very grateful and appreciative for having this precious opportunity, opportunity to meet all of you here online. First of all, I would like to send my greetings and warm welcome to our special guest in this event, namely His Holiness the Dalai Lama, most venerable Makulive Mimala Mahanayake Tero from Sri Lanka, as well as all other Venerable and scholars, and also Venerable Dhammapiya, and all other guests, distinguished guests. I sincerely wish and pray for your good health and well being. The topic of this conference is the three trainings in Pali and Sanskrit traditions of Buddhism. When I look at these lines, the very first thing that comes to my mind is that. What is the purpose of the Buddha of propagating these teachings of the three trainings? Definitely, it is to help all mother sentient beings to liberate themselves from all sufferings and to attain ultimate peace and happiness. As human beings, we are constantly troubled by two major problems. When we are still alive, we are bound to have various problems such as physical illnesses and mental discomforts. And we also have other issues such as environment, environmental problems, social issues, political instability, etc. According to the levels of our own merits, we will then experience different levels of happiness or unhappiness. But no matter how great or how less our merits could be, we are going to face a bigger and most crucial problem of all at the end, which is what will happen to us during the time of our death. So this is the second major problem that I'm talking about. So in order to permanently solve these two problems of ours, the Buddha had given us the guidance of following the Noble Eightfold Path to practice and attain. By practicing this Noble Eightfold Path, we're able to transcend and purify all our worldly problems without giving rise to negative emotions of ours and others. And we can face our death peacefully, fearlessly, and maybe we can go through it joyfully as well. 
Buddha taught about the Four Noble Truths and the Twelve Links of Interdependent Arising during his first turning on the wheel of Dharma, with the main purpose to make us know the suffering, the Dukkha, and to cut off the sufferings, to practice the path that leads to the cessation of the suffering, and lastly, to attain the ultimate state of peacefulness that we call Nirvana. If you want to attain liberation and ultimately Buddhahood for the sake of all beings, we must therefore follow the teachings of the Buddha and to practice his instructions accordingly with the attitude of gratitude and diligence. But how should we practice this then? We have to follow the gradual path and methods of the Noble Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths. As we know, the scope of the Noble Eightfold Path is very wide and it covers extensively the practices of the three trainings and the Four Noble Truths as well. We cannot establish the reality of the Four Noble Truths without having practiced the Noble Eightfold Path. And since the Noble Eightfold Path is inseparable from the Noble so from the Four Noble Truths, it is therefore closely related and inseparable from the Twelve Links of Interdependent, the Interdependent Arising as well. We can therefore say that the Twelve Links of Interdependent Arising simply show us the reality of suffering. The Four Noble Truths embodies the process of pacifying these sufferings and the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path will enable, will enable us to pacify completely the cause of these sufferings. The Noble Eightfold Path is actually the truth of the path that leads to the cessation of suffering as mentioned in the Four Noble Truths. If we don't practice the Noble Eightfold Path, we won't be able to attain the wisdom, wisdom of Nirvana. And if we don't attain the wisdom of Nirvana, we will not be able to completely relinquish the cause of suffering and attain the cessation of suffering. We will then be caught up in and forever entangled by the endless cyclic existence as indicated in the 12 links of interdependent arising. We are still being trapped in samsara and won't be able to attain liberation. Therefore, the truth of the path should be applied and utilized to totally relinquish the cause of suffering and to attain the state of cessation of the suffering. And these two truths, the truth of suffering and the truth of the cause of suffering are none other than the causality of the three life, past, present and future of ours, as it was said, exemplified in the process of traveling of interdependent arising. If you really want to obtain freedom of liberation from the 12 links of interdependent arising and the entanglement of samsara, we have no choice but to practice the Noble Eightfold Path. We can therefore conclude that the practice of the Noble Path is indeed the perfect antidote to the cyclic existence of samsara. Uh, we, we are bound to the cyclic existence of samsara due to the 12 links of interdependent arising. In short, the actual content of the Noble Eightfold Path is long under than the excellence of the three trainings. So therefore, we have to practice sila, moral conduct to pacify greed. We practice samadhi, meditation to pacify hatred, and prajna, wisdom to pacify ignorance. In short, if we diligently practice the three trainings of sila, samadhi, and prajna, we can definitely pacify or purify all of our greeds, hatred, and ignorance. About the essence of the three trainings, I would like to quote a verse mentioned in the Dhammapada. Tame your mind in with sila or moral conduct. Guard your thoughts with right samadhi or meditation. Practice inwardly shamatha, calm abiding and vipassana, special insights, and attain the right wisdom with constant mindfulness. These four lines are actually the basic principles in the practice of Buddha Dharma. These four lines talk about a life of moral conduct a life of spiritual calmness and peacefulness, and a life full of wisdom and wise insights. This is actually the practice and attainment of the three trainings. So when we say tame your mind with sila or moral conduct, it means we need to be constantly aware and take care of our body, speech, and mind so that they can be virtuous and non-harmful. When we say guard your thoughts with right samadhi or meditation, it means we should practice both shamatha and vipassana in order to bring our mind home to its original purity and peacefulness and attain the right wisdom with constant mindfulness. This means we need to attain ultimate wisdom of enlightenment, 
by practicing right knowledge, right views, the right mindfulness, and right thoughts. Hence, as I mentioned before, if we diligently practice the three trainings of sila, samadhi, and prajna, we can definitely pacify all of our greed, hatred, and ignorance. What is the real meaning of sila then? It doesn't mean that we are forbidden to say or do this and that, but we are simply guided and or instructed to know what should be adopted and what should be abandoned. In terms of our behavior, we must know what needs to be said or do, or what needs to be avoided at all costs. For example, the non virtuous deeds of killing, stealing, and sexual misconduct, etc., are all caused by our mental afflictions such as dissatisfaction, greed, hatred, etc. If we uphold the precepts and follow a lifestyle of moral conducts, we can therefore pacify all these negative emotions within our mind streams. So, tame your mind here means to pacify and purify all our negative emotions, such as the three poisons of greed, hatred, and ignorance. When we tame or pacify our monkey mind, we will then become more stable, happier, and more peaceful human beings. And once we have stabilized or pacified our monkey mind, we need to also guard it mindfully so that it will not be disturbed by outer stimuli or distractions. Once we can make our mind stable, peaceful, and constantly uphold it into the state of calm abiding, our mind will then gradually into, enter into the state of right samadhi. Right samadhi comes from right mindfulness, but incorrect samadhi is totally the opposite of that. In order to protect our mind from being easily deluded and distracted by material world, or outer conditions, we should try to nurture a mental state of contentment and also strive to practice shamatha and vipassana gradually and consistently. The practice of shamatha means to make our mind calm and peaceful, to focus our mind onto a particular state of being. And the practice of vipassana means we observe or watch the movement or stillness of our mind with penetrative insights so that we could realize or attain the reality of all phenomena. If we could constantly and diligently practice shamatha and vipassana, our mind will become so peaceful, so calm, and so wise. In other words, if we don't give rise to any negative thoughts, there's already shamatha. If we can give rise to clear mind and observe it, its luminosity moment to moment, there's already vipassana. Without any evil thought, it's right mindfulness. And when we practice shamatha and vipassana with right mindfulness, we will then attain right samadhi and right meditation. From right samadhi, that we can attain right wisdom. This right wisdom is the opposite of wicked intelligence, which will only guide us astray to wrong paths, such as confrontation, competition, and intention to harm or destroy others merely for one's own benefit. But right wisdom is the wisdom that enables us to be constructively, constructively decisive and proactive, to understand the universal law of cause and effect, to help and heal others, to make ourselves and others peaceful and happy, to protect us from being distracted by the eight worldly dhammas and to face, manage, and resolve all interpersonal issues and problems wisely and nicely. This is impartial wisdom, which is non-selfish and totally altruistic, unharmful, ahimsa, and therefore beneficial to oneself and others. Therefore, if we practice sila in the three trainings, we can attain and protect our mental and physical well-being, which is holistic health. If we practice samadhi, we will become more peaceful, calm and stable in our thoughts and emotions. If we practice prajna, the wisdom, then our mind will be always be clear and pure. And we are able to handle our daily events and issues wisely, objectively, smartly, and decisively. And we can also bring more joy and happiness to others. In short, Buddhists or non-Buddhists, let us all practice these three trainings together so that we can co-create a more peaceful and a wonderful world for the sake of all mother sentient beings. Thank you, and may all of you be well and happy. Thank you, may all be well and happy. Amitabha. international conference now so we will be translating your most venerable speech into english now thank you oh.
Okay, so now, um, so next I would like to introduce our third opening remarks speaker, uh, Most Venerable Dr. Dhammadipa, Dhammapiya from India. Venerable Dr. Dhammapiya is the Secretary General of the International Buddhist Confederation or IBC as a global umbrella of Buddhist body with membership drawn from 39 countries of over 32, 320 organizations from both monastic and lay people to preserve, share, and promote the Buddhist teachings and values in the global discourse. So now may I invite most venerable Dr. Dhammapiya to give um, his opening remarks for our conference. Thank you. Namo Matasa Bhagavatam Buddhasa Buddham Saranam Gachami Dhammam Saranam Gachami Sangham Saranam Gachami I take this opportunity to express my deep respect to His Holiness the Dalai Lama and also greetings to all venerable members of Mahasangha, esteemed Upasakas and Upasikas for, for we have come online on this online international uh, Buddhist conference from different traditions across the globe. We are discussing today on the topic, three shiksha in Sanskrit or the sikha in Pali tradition. This is only a nomenclature or the name. Whether we call three shiksha or the sikha, it refers to the same teachings of the Buddha. We may have different traditions, different branches, but our root is the same. Our Buddha is the same. Sakyamuni, the Buddha, and his teachings, Dhamma, Vinaya. We all follow the same teaching, but in different languages, in different dialects, in different socio-geographical setup or socio-cultural background. As I have said, we have only one root in different branches. And it is really a great opportunity and we are very much thankful to His Holiness for organizing this kind of coming together of different Buddhist traditions from different countries, different background, to prove that we coexist harmoniously among our Buddhist brethren, brothers and sisters. Do we follow either Nalanda tradition or Theravada tradition or other tradition, whatever we name, but we coexist. We understand our teaching is the same. So we already had some time back the dialogue on Vinaya, where we found there is no difference. Though the language, the preserve, we preserve the teaching, the Vinaya is different, but essentially the Vinaya is the same. So also the Dhamma, the teachings of the Buddha is the same. So here, the teachings of the Buddha, the, the main teachings of the Buddha, it can be subsumed under Tisikha or Trishiksha, that is Sila, Samadhi, Panya, as we understand. And the teachings of the Buddha is scientific. It is a science. Where to start? Basically, we see 
the starting point of the teachings of the Buddha that Buddha himself has started, the first is Dasana. In Pali, it's called Dasana, means objective observation, knowing objectively the state of affairs that exist in the surrounding. That's what Siddhartha Gautama, when he set out to see things around his palace, he first observed the things around and he found that old man, sick man, dead body, and this, then the saint or the or monk. That's for the observation. So Buddha's teaching starts with observation, objective observation, know the things as it is. That is what very important that Buddha's teaching is a scientific, it's a science. And next step in the Buddha's teaching or in the process of learning, acquiring knowledge in Buddhism is Vassana. Vassana means after you observe things, then you start questioning, what is that? You start analyzing how things happen. You start doing research, verifying, trying to understand deeply about the interdependent nature of things. It is not only one thing exists, but there are many things that exist, they are interdependent. That is actually pasana, trying to know things, the reality at the deeper level. That means when we proceed from dasana to pasana, we are removing the element of blind faith. There is no blind faith in the Buddha Dhamma, in Buddhism, because we are directly trying to know the reality with objectivity, analysis, and direct experience. So there is no blind faith, and there is no uh, element of accepting something which is not clear. Then next step in the process is vipassana. In vipassana, one goes deeper and deeper, deeper, and deepest level where one understands the Dhamma, the reality, the nature, at the energy level, at the energy level, that is uh, in a very deepest level, only kalapas, where one finds whatever things are there appearing to us, it is not solid. It is not how it appears to us. There is something deeper meaning whereby it comes, the concept of anicca, dukkha, anatta. That means things appear to us as permanent, solid, but Essentially, it is not permanent, it is impermanent. It is continuous flux and flow. It's a floating, flowing, anicca, impermanent. That's what it, it comes clearer, the deeper level when one does vipassana. Then dukkha, that means whatever things are floating, impermanent, it has the characteristics of unsatisfactoriness, dissatisfaction. That's how one comes to realize that is, Vipassana is a state of realization of this impermanent nature and then the unsatisfactoriness, the satisfaction in whatever things that exist. And then anatta, that is the egolessness, selflessness, not I. We cling too much to I. So when we do Vipassana, when we practice Vipassana, then at that level, we find there's no I as such. No atma means no I, no ego nothing as something called self. So this is the realization of anicca, dukkha, anatta at the deepest level at vipassana when we do these things. And when we are talking about this tisikha, the sila sikha, samadhi sikha, and panya sikha, it's very important that to have a right view, right perspective, right understanding of things, Unless until we have right perspective, right view, right mapping of the world and the life, then the light and also the world may lead to astray. That is what is happening nowadays. We are confronted with so many kind of challenges and uh, uh, crises cropped up due to wrong understanding, a wrong perception that we are having about the world. We want more and more things in our life at the cost of destroying animals, nature, and the forest, environment. So human greed has caused so much suffering to the world. And this is a wrong understanding about life. 
That is why we need this Sila Sikha, Samadhi Sikha, Panna Sikha to have the right understanding of things, the interdependent nature of things. It is not that we only human beings to exist. We think we are intelligent, powerful, and we can command over everything in the universe, in the world. That is not the case. The even, case. If we, even if we can do that, but it will have negative impact. Samadhi Sikha, it is a process of purifying the mind, cultivating the mind, developing the mind and heart, mind and heart, both the Chitta and the Hadhaya. So when we go to the second stage of the Sikha, that is Samadhi Sikha, a person's mind and heart can be developed, a purified mind, a compassionate mind, which is very necessary nowadays, very necessary where we have seen the whole world is undergoing through a crisis of extremism, violence, and so much of materialism. Here we need this something called Majjima Patipada, that is the middle path, where we have to have a moderation in our behavior, moderation in our approach, moderation in our action, moderation in our thought, lifestyle. So moderation or the middle path is very much relevant here. That is how actually Samadhi and Panya Sikha both are very much relevant here. When a person develops the mind, cultivates the mind and purifies the mind and, and achieve the state of compassionate heart and purified mind and if all the human beings collectively follow this uh, sikha, put uh, the, all the uh, sila sikha, samadhi sikha, and panya sikha. Then, what will be the result is it will have positive impact in the society, in the world at large. So, at last, I would like to uh, conclude by saying the relevance of the tis sikha is very much important to have a compassionate heart and clear and purified mind, and also a right perspective, right view about the world, to have a balanced mind, avoiding all extremism, violence, and to have a peaceful, harmonious coexistence and sustainable development in the world. Thank you so much, everybody. Bhavatu Sabha Mangal. Thank you, most venerable. Dr. Dhamma Pia for your um, opening speech. Um, as we all know, we are all the same Buddhists. Uh, we spread out throughout the world. And this is actually maybe the first time that we can actually get together as one Sangha member and unite for the same cause of following the footsteps of the Buddha. And as members of one united Sangha, your holiness, following the teachings of the same Buddha all of us here, we are grateful that we have your holiness as an example of how all the Buddhist teachings of compassion and wisdom can truly manifest into reality. As now both um, Buddhists of the Pali and the Sanskrit traditions have come together to share the precious teachings of the Buddha that has been passed on throughout uh, different generations in our respective traditions of Pali and Sanskrit. Now, we would humbly like to request your holiness to please give us the inaugural speech for our conference that we have come together today and which would be followed by a Q&A session afterwards. So please, Your Holiness, please give us your wise words. Thank you. Thank you, Luthor. No. Thank you. Uh, conclusion is on the Quatamdela Oh, and I did, uh, she 
de de do me rodi de ya kora ke ke kam do me ba chawal de ne de do me ra yung yo re ne de tam jo lo ge lo ju chik yu chi mi sa ba sa ko cho go re da che shen ben ge da da ha sam yu de ji ku re se de chu lu sa ma lo sun bu de wa e ne e zo li de ga ge chu lu shi zo ro ko ba do e tu bu ni che wei na ani jigen ko bo de gen ge chu chu chi jigen ko bo mi de gen ge chu chu chi che ne ti ni jalo de ru me da yor de jigen ko bo de ya ko ra ani jigen ko bo cham ji de ni re ma zu sa mo lo jigen ko bo cham ji de ni di ko ba de si zu sa ne ma ran zo be pa ye chuo ro kun jo jigen ko bo kun jo de ani cham ji de ni yin ba yi de ta ne ma ran zo sa mo lo kunjo te ta ko e be chi ta kunjo se so cha de yo re sa de de yin de ta ne ba sa mo lo ge mo ne cham ji de ma ji ta che ko du se se ya de chu lu sa mo lo sun du wa ko de ru me ra yin bu yo re so ta a en ga ran zo san ji be ta a chu lu na lo re ya ta a de ge te ri sha na ji re da ga da a na lin de chi 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 da ene a ta ba le ge chi 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 sha ni to sanskrit ta ya chi da ene a ba li ke la ta ya chi gi ta me da shi ni do ta ga na ba li ge shu di di ga da san ji ve chi ke mo shi cha de yo re da ta du wen yam ne ene le ja ge shi ju li cha sha ne de ge shu na shi ri du wen yam ne mo shi ri da da le ya ene shi tan je yo me de ba ene ke je de ba ene mongu yo de ba o de de ge de ba me ra ka she yo re cha sa ga a ma ran zo pe le yo be di shi tan je yo me de ba di pe je re sha ene ja na ra mongu yo de ba ka chu su ge de ba che o da de ba me ra me ra yo re yi ne kada de sa mo lo e so so ta ba so so ta ba ta por ti mo xia de ga sa mo lo ji bo le de wa sa mo ji bo le a che ni ta ga da pa le ge xiong de san ji be che ge be mo xi le cha sha a ta de ne ja wa le ya na lin de ya ri xiong ge de ne cha de yo re ene na lin de ene le ja te se te du ja le ya le ja ge di chi xin jin ge ta ge so cha de yo re sa de ni yin du en a na lin de ne o da ga da sanskrit was uh, 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 the, uh, the official uh, language practiced by the scholars uh, so the tradition uh, of uh, na, uh, na lin de uh, was preserved in this uh, Uh, Sanskrit language, and in Tibet, uh, Shandarakshida, uh, who was a great uh, Nalanda master, was invited. Uh, and uh, the Tibetan king at that time, King Tizong Dezeng, seeing that uh, India is the very root of uh, the very source of Buddha Dharma uh, and the origin of Buddha Dharma, although at that time uh, Buddha Dharma has already flourished uh, in China, and despite that. Uh, Uh, King Tizong Dezong of Tibet uh, invited Shandarakshita to Tibet. So at that time, Shandarakshita advised the Tibetans that since you have a different script aside, different language, instead of uh, learning or studying, uh, so uh, instead of learning uh, Pali or Sanskrit, you should translate this text into Tibetan. And then, based on that translation, if you were to engage in study, contemplation, and meditation, or, or on the teachings, that would be really helpful. So, with such advice, uh, we have uh, uh, Tibetans have translated more than uh, uh, 108 uh, traditions in uh, 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 from Buddha's own sutras from Sanskrit, and. Uh, And among them, we have around 13 traditions on uh, Vinaya. And also 
when it comes to the uh, um, vehicle of uh, on wisdom, we have a very vast uh, number of treatises. On top of those uh, uh, sutras translated into Tibetan, we have also translated uh, the commentaries by Indian masters, which we call as Tengur or uh, uh, the commentarial uh, translations uh, running into more than 200 uh, treatises. So all of these texts are now available in, available in Tibetan, and that's what we study. And these are what we study. So the Buddha Dhamma, the tradition that has flourished in Tibet has been introduced by Shandarakshita. And that uh, tradition, this tradition is really comprehensive. And then there is so much emphasis on epistemology or uh, logic. Uh, Shandarakshita himself has had composed a text on Buddhist epistemology or the art of reasoning. So these are uh, texts, uh, the uh, text on logic, uh, or Ramada Vatika uh, is one such text. So when relying on such uh, texts of uh, uh, epistemology, uh, uh, what we uh, learn to do is we simply don't rely on the uh, text literally, but uh, investigate on the meaning of the text, analyze on the meaning of that text. And then past Indian masters such as Nagarjan and so forth, uh, they all explain uh, their uh, teachings to reasoning. Particularly, uh, Dignag and Tharmakiti, these two apostles of uh, uh, Buddhist logic, uh, they have composed their text for example, the text Pramana Vatika by Dharmakiti is one of the main texts that we study in Tibet. For myself, since the age of seven or age, I have uh, studied Pramana Vatika, uh, like the prelim preliminary logic and mind system in Buddhism. So from childhood, I have studied them. So the uh, in Tibet, the uh, is a widespread interest in the tradition of logic. And uh, this uh, Buddhist uh, uh, art of reasoning is very, very important. Nowadays, uh, in a modern world, uh, the, the world has progressed so much in science. And the uh, approach of modern scientists is they rely on reasoning. Likewise, uh, as Buddhists, if we were to rely literally on Buddha's teaching, then there will be some uh, difficulties. However, Buddha Shakyamuni himself has given us this uh, uh, freedom, bhikshus or bhikshus and uh, uh, scholars, just as a goldsmith would rub the gold, grind it, cut it to uh, get the um, purity of the uh, gold. Likewise, you should also do the same thing with uh, my teachings. So Buddha Shakyamuni himself has given us uh, this permission to investigate his own teachings. So therefore, uh, uh, the text of Brahmana Vatiko or logic or reasoning uh, are very important. So therefore, uh, I uh, would like to uh, uh, advise those uh, uh, following the Pali tradition to give importance to the study of uh, epistemology or logic or reasoning. And apart from the text on Pramana Vatika, uh, we also have uh, text in on Prajna Parimita. Mm. And we have uh, 21 commentaries uh, to uh, the Prajna Parimita Sutras. So all of these has been, these uh, different commentaries, 21 commentaries by uh, in masters have uh, been explained in greater detail by Tsongkhapa in his uh, uh, golden rosary of uh, excellent instructions. So the uh, text on uh, Pramada Vatika, uh, Prachaparamita and Matyamika, these are very, very important uh, for all of us to study. 
And among Tsongkhapa's uh, writings, he has given more emphasis on uh, these three uh, topics and hasn't written much on Abhidharma and Vinaya because in Abhidharma and Vinaya, there is less usage of reasoning. And so in Vinaya, you simply adhere more, uh, there is more uh, emphasis on, on adherence to adherence to what are uh, words than reasoning. And, and Vasubandhu who composed the Tama, uh, sorry, Abhidhamma uh, text. Abhidhamma Koshikarika. Uh, uh, for example, Indian te uh, scholars like Dharma, Gupta, uh, Diknak, uh, Vasubhati, this, uh, their own way of uh, presenting ultimate reality has been rejected by Chandrakirti. When it comes to uh, the understanding of the mental factors, as explained in uh, uh, Vasubhati's Abhidhamma Koshakarika, uh, there isn't much uh, we have uh, uh, there uh, in terms of the views. And also as far as this uh, uh, the explanation of uh, uh, the physical world is concerned, mm, the natural world is concerned, uh, uh, the universe is concerned. Uh, I feel uh, Vasubandhu's explanation, uh, especially of uh, explanation of Mount Meru in the middle being surrounded by other universes. Uh, I feel uh, those uh, uh, shouldn't be taken literally. And also as far as the distance uh, uh, between the earth and the moon and sun, uh, what has been explained in Vasubandhi's text uh, couldn't be uh, taken literally. Uh, sun is far much further uh, than the moon. Uh, in terms of its uh, distance uh, from the the earth. So I feel like because of all age, uh, Vasubandhu was not able to see the distance properly. So he might have made a mistake there. Uh, so that's uh, sometimes I, uh, uh, you know, uh, jokingly uh, explain uh, uh, why it happened. So when uh, Vasubhani explains uh, uh, the universe as having uh, Mount Mary and so forth, uh, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to uh, accept uh, his teachings on um, them literally. But when it comes to Vinaya, then we have the monastic vows, which has a lot of uh, uh, teachings on the monastic practice, such as the 220. Uh, 253 precepts for the uh, monastics and so forth. So very vast. So in Tibet, we have uh, a very uh, comprehensive study uh, on these five uh, classical treatises. Particularly, uh, the study is uh, complemented uh, uh, with the study of uh, logic. And so this study is, the studies on these texts are carried away through reasoning. So because of such emphasis on logic, uh, and since we don't rely on uh, scriptural, scriptural authority and give more precedence to reasoning, it becomes very easy for us to uh, interact with modern scientists. So, So since uh, all of you, the scholars and the monastics are going to have an, have discussions on the three trainings, mm, I would like to say this, uh, Buddhism nowadays on this world uh, has, uh, is drawing interest in places where it has never ever um, been known in, the, uh, in some secluded places around the world. And so because of that, now it's very important for us to have a, a good interaction with one another and uh, uh, with the foundation in Vinaya, we should practice uh, uh, 
concentration and wisdom. And of course, uh, I'm sure you will carry on this practice properly. But nowadays, even among uh, those who have no interest in uh, Dharma, uh, the wisdom, practice of wisdom and uh, practice of concentration uh, are actually very much uh, relevant uh, to those who have no religious tradition at all. And then when uh, coming across convergent points, that's a different thing. But if there are divergences, then we have to see how they need to be interpreted. Some questions? Thank you, Your Holiness. Um, as we have seen that uh, it must have been very, very difficult for our uh, masters in the past to come together, especially in different languages and cultures to learn from one another. And today with our technologies and difficulties, uh, there are some technical difficulties as well. So we'll try to get through to that. And today before the Q&A session with Your Holiness, um, I would humbly like to ask for uh, most venerable from Sri Lanka to give a few words before Your Holiness proceed with the Q&A session just shortly after this, if I may. So just for now, um, I would like to invite our another remark speaker from most venerable from Sri Lanka, most venerable Makulewe Wimala Mahani Ketero. Um, venerable is the Supreme Head of Sri Lanka, Ramana Mahanikaya, and most venerable had been joining us today with the honorable title of Akra Maha Pandita, which was conferred to him from, from Myanmar in 2019. So today, before the Q&A session with Your Holiness, I would like to ask Most Venerable from Sri Lanka to please give his um, opening remarks to our conference. Thank you, Most Venerable. So most venerable Makilwe Wimala Mahani Yatero is the, is the supreme head of the Sri Lankan Ramana Mahanikaya. He has great impact at the Buddhist religious and educational sectors and both in the national and the international level from Sri Lanka. So now, please most venerable, I would like to ask you to give the opening remarks. Thank you. Uh, most, most Venerable Makilwe Wimala Mahane Ketero. <laughs> As you can see, this conference has been um, started and gone. We've been working together for 15 countries. We translate into 15 uh, languages today. So a few technical issues might occur. So. Uh, maybe most venerable. Oh, okay. Thank you, most venerable. Please proceed. Yes. So, most venerable Makilwe Wimala Mahadi Getero from Sri Lanka provide us with the opening remarks for our conference today. Okay, thank you. <laughs> the setting up has been very challenging for all these different countries to come together. So thank you all for your patience. Most Venerable, you can proceed. Thank you. His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Most Venerable Bhikshu Ching Yao, Most Venerable Dr. Dhamma Pia, 
the members of Maasanga, erudit speakers, scholars, delegates, distinguished guests and participants. I must thank you all for inviting me to address this Dhamma gathering because it is my duty as a Buddhist monk to help everyone to lead a good life. To lead, to lead a good life, uh, to Shiksha, nearly, namely Sila, Samadhi, and Panya play a very significant role. The pathway to the Nibbana, also known as uh, Majima Patipada, middle pathway, or the Noble Eightfold Path, preached by the Blessed Supreme Buddha, is composed of a mass of virtues, the Sila, concentration, Samadhi, and uh, wisdom, Panya. Virtue is to tame the body and the speech. Concentration is the focus of the mind and wisdom is the supreme insight that is able to see the true nature of the world. The Supreme Buddha discussed in the Mahapari Nibbana Sutta that the concentration based on the virtues is a great advantage that is Virtuousness helps our concentration. Samadhi pari pavito panna hoti mahani samso. Therefore, it is the wisdom of the path and its fruition that are based on uh, concentration. So, therefore, it is greatly advantageous. It is said that samadhi helps one to attain the supreme enlightenment. The Buddha also said that the mind, which is born out of wisdom, will be free from associations and will realize the enlightenment through the fruition of other hardships. Therefore, virtuous behaviors leads to concentration of samadhi, and the strong concentration that leads to the purification of the wisdom of um, that, that was derived from the inside meditation. The virtue, sila. Virtue, sila means the fourfold virtues. Those are the virtues of rules proclaimed by the Buddha, Pratimokkha sila, the virtue of taming of the senses, indriya sambara sila, the virtue of purifying the, the livelihood, Ativa Parisuddhi Sila, and the virtue of using requisite Pachaya Sane Sita Sila. Padimokkha Samvara Sira is the virtue of rules proclaimed by the true, the Buddha. The virtue of higher ordained monks that is composed of 227 Padimokkha rules and billions of small rules, 10 major rules, and the Sekiya rules for the Samaneras and rules for the lay persons that comprise of five precepts, 10 precepts, etc. Uh, those are the, we call uh, the practice of Pratimokkha. The Sri Buddha preached the discipline of the Pratimokkha Samvarasira saying that, accordingly, if a bhikkhu or a person behaves appropriately, knowing the appropriate and inappropriate places to behave and adequate of behavior, he is afraid of even the slightest offense. And if he, he disciplines the precepts enacted by the Supreme Buddha. It is the practice of Pratimokkha. Sense control, Indriya Samvara Sila, is the taming of the senses such as eyes, ears, nose, etc. It is the practice of the senses to see the images with the eyes and to take them away without taking any of their signs, symptoms, or interests. The Supreme Buddha preached the discipline of the Indriya Samvara Sila, saying that. Capturing the signs or nimity of the images seen by the eye, such as male or female, auspicious or inauspicious, that creates a defilement, is an eye opener. The hands, feet, smiles, stars of speech, looks, etc., of the image that's seen are called Amviyani Jana. It is also an eye opener to look at these images in this way. Therefore, the sense of control is formed by considering the way in which the Blessed One spoke such as without seeing the signs of implication of what is seen with the eyes. Ajiva Parisudhi Sila is a practice of avoiding the wrong livelihood and adjusting one's life for the correct livelihood. He enacted six precepts of livelihood for the monks and the purification of those precepts and the abstinence from the wrong livelihood, such as Kohana, Labana, Nemitikata, Nipesikata, etc. The virtue of livelihood can also be called abstinence from the erroneous traits of alcohol, drugs, weapons, poisons, animal trade for meat, and the slave, slave trade, which the Supreme Buddha said should not be practiced by virtuous beings who wish to attain Nibbana. 
Acharya Sanisita Sila is the practice of consuming the requisites such as food, clothing, household, medicine, etc., considering consciously. The Buddha advises that a bhikkhu should reconsider every time he consumes these four requisites. This practice of fourfold virtues is called the virtues. That virtues, this virtue practice helps us to strength, to strengthen our concentration. Next, the concentration or samadhi. Concentration is a state of mental focus. Samadhi is the careful keeping of the mind so that it is not scattered in any one state of the mind as stated in Ekaramani Chitta Chitta Sikanam Sama Sama Cha Adanam Samadhi. So it is stated in this sutra that sutta that it can be interpreted in many ways as Upachara Samadhi, Apana Samadhi, etc. The samadhi that arises before apana, which is the absorption, is called upachara samadhi. Six anusadi meditations such as Buddha anusati, the upasa manusati, and the marana anusati, the particular sana of foods, and the chatu datu vabandana give a upachara samadhi. Also be called the abstinence. Apana Samadhi is the concentration from the first absorption, etc. Accordingly, Rupa Avachara, first absorption, second absorption, tertiary absorption, and fourth absorption, and Arupa Avachara absorption that are Akasana Chayatana, Vinana Chayatana, Akichana Nayatana. Neva Sanana Sanadhyatana are also what we call as uh, concentrations. Next is so wisdom, Panna. Panna is an inside knowledge associated with the wholesome mind. It is a wisdom that is capable of realizing the fruition of the path by understanding the truth of impermanence. Uh, dukkha, suffering, misery, uh, no self, and detachment from the rituals. A sign is the recognition of something as, for example, blue, yellow, etc., just by seeing it. Consciousness is the realization of the transcendental features of what is to be known or seen. Such as the it is wisdom that makes one understand and translate the path to the realization of such transcendental features. Absorption, second absorption, tertiary absorption, and fourth absorption, and arupa third absorption. The way in which a child, a villager, and a goldsmith knowing about a piece of gold are quite different. A child who knows nothing can play with it without knowing anything about a piece of gold. Such is a sign of recognizing something. A village man does not know its value exactly. That recognition is our consciousness, a jeweler recognizing a piece of gold correctly. That is the wisdom of understanding. Accordingly, the wisdom associated with the inside meditation, which sees the true nature of the impermanence, misery, and infinite nature of the samkaras correctly and attains nibbana to the realization of the path, is called the wisdom of panna. Next, the Eightfold, the Noble Eightfold Path. The Noble Eightfold Path spoken by the Supreme Buddha as a middle pathway is composed of the three masters of virtuous behavior, sila concentration, samadhi, and wisdom, panya. Arahan Dhammadina Anand preached in the Chula Vedala Sutta to Vishaka devotees that the, eight, the Noble Eightfold Path is composed of the three masters of virtuous behavior, sila, samadhi, and the wisdom. Accordingly, right speech, samavacha, right action, samakamata, and mode of livelihood, samajiva, are integrated into the virtue, sila skanda, right effort, samayamana, mindfulness, samasati, and rapture, or right meditation, samasamari, 
are in the category or basket of concentration of samadhi kanda and the right view samadhi and aspiration samasankapa are integrated into the mass or category of wisdom or panya in performing any wholesome deeds with the wisdom at least some of these elements are completed they are integrated with the sila concentration and wisdom masses that wisdom associated with wholesome deeds completes the right view right aspiration is a wholesome aspiration right speech right actions right mode of livelihood associated with wholesome deeds are the respective elements the virtuous spiritual energy is the right effort mindfulness associated with the wholesome deeds is the mindfulness element the mental factor of concentration is then the right concentration samadhi thus the perfection of the noble eightfold path the frequency of our virtuous deeds concentration and wisdom is actually the path of enlightenment spoken by the supreme buddha the supreme buddha say that the one who cultivates it who cultivates it well will then achieve the ultimate result uh, of liberation and ultimate uh, freedom sili pitiyana naros pano chitam panachara bhavamam attapi nipako bhikkhu so imam vijataye chatam thus the buddha said the bhikkhu who is based on the fourfold purification of virtues and who is growing in mental concentration and wisdom and who is endowed with the wisdom of purifying the defiled energies realizes nibbana by losing losing all the entanglements entanglements of desires of samsara thank you most venerable makilo we mala ma and may you be blessed with the tri ratna buddha dhamma and sangha thank you most venerable makilo we mala mahane ketero Uh, most Rainbow is joining us from all the way from Sri Lanka, which is not an easy thing to arrange this big conference that we are doing today. So thank you everyone for joining us today. As you can see, uh, many traditions, many languages uh, coming together is not easy at all. So it's not an easy task to bring together the Buddhists of the Bali and the Sanskrit tradition. So now we would come to the Q&A session where uh, the audience had sent in questions to ask your holiness to please guide us on how we can connect and come together as one buddhist sangha in the bali and sanskrit tradition so now we would like to start our q and a session with your holiness if i may um, all of these questions would be in english um, and we would respond accordingly so our course, first question um, i would like to ask venerable an from vietnam to please uh, ask your question to your holiness at this time venerable an thank you hey, to see you here and uh, good morning uh, most venerable venerable speaker and distinguished guest So uh, thank you for giving me giving me opportunity to ask the question. So my question is, how can we build up the bridge between Bali and Sanri tradition? Thank you. you. Mentioned the Vinaya or or Purusha Moksha. That is the same. Pali, Pali tradition and Sanskrit tradition, both. So, uh, like this kind of meeting, uh, the scholars, practitioners, so both a tradition together and, and exchange. And it becomes very clear, same. And Vinaya is same. Basis of uh, Buddhist, Buddhist, or the Buddhist practice. Shila, Shamatha, also same. 
Then, vipassana. What way? No. Vipassana. Then, there are different, uh, even within, uh, what's the Sanskrit tradition, there are a different school of thought. Mainly, Vipassik, the Sodantic, Chitta Mantra, and the Madhimika, like that. So there are differences. The Vinaya practice is foundation and same, both for the tradition. So like this kind of meeting, uh, uh, I want to say most welcome, a very important meeting. Thank you. Okay, thank, you, your holi thank you, Your Holiness. Uh, we would have two more questions for this session. So our next question uh, from Ms. Tan Lian Chu from Singapore, please. Thank you. Good morning. Tashi Dele from Singapore, Your Holiness. Thank you for this great honor and privilege to be with you and everyone else at this conference here today. My question is, would it be possible for the Pali and Sanskrit traditions to find enough common ground from the three trainings translated into secular terms and used as teaching curriculum in schools for general moral education? Okay. Since uh, common practice, there are many common practice. So you see, uh, uh, school, student, you see, uh, the essence, you see, uh, don't harm other and respect others' right. That's the basis. So all from uh, Pali tradition, Sanskrit tradition, you can take uh, sort of say, the advice. So certainly can do. Okay. As I, mentioned, as I mentioned earlier, Vinaya practice is same, common. Okay. Okay, thank you, Your Holiness. Um, so now we come to our last question for today uh, from Brother Tan from Malaysia. Brother Tan from Malaysia, please ask your question. Good morning, Your Holiness. Thank you for this opportunity. How, my question is, how to be a good Buddhist? Oh. Thank you very much. I think, Buddha Mishanam Gajami, Dharma Mishanam Gajami, Sangam Sanam Gajami, uh, not only just to repeat that word, but what is Buddha, what is Dharma, what is Sangha, uh, you see, with some understanding, then Buddha Mishanam Gajami, Dharma Mishanam Gajami, Sangam Sanam Gajami, uh, and automatically become Buddhist. Okay, then more in detail, what is Buddha, what is Dharma, what is Sangha? Uh, more in detail, uh, uh, what's the explanation? You need the more study like that. Okay. Okay, thank you, Your Holiness. So this would, go, would conclude our Q&A session for today. And thank you, Your Holiness, for giving us the inaugural speech for our main conference that is coming up today and tomorrow on Thrice Siksha. This is the conference that comes together with uh, the Buddhist from both traditions, from Pali and Sanskrit traditions. Your Holiness, most venerables, and all beings in this great assembly, uniting the Sangha of different traditions, not to be the same, but to be harmonious, has been Your Holiness' wish for a very long time. So we thank you for being our great inspiration, Your Holiness. 
and maybe wish that your um, wish for benefiting all beings would manifest. And this would conclude our inaugural session this morning, Your Holiness. Thank you so much. And I, I myself, as a follower of Buddha and Bhikshu, and also uh, some sort of knowledge through study from, from childhood. So I very much appreciate this kind of meeting. So uh, I hope uh, annually this kind of meeting, more serious discussion will be very useful. So I'm looking forward to uh, our next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you, Thank you Your Holiness. Thank, you. Thank yeah. you, Your Holiness. Our heartfelt appreciation and thanks uh, for your presence today and also to the most venerable opening remark speakers for taking their time to be with us today. With us online, uh, today are the monastic members and the public audience from various countries. And we hope that today's inaugural session revive and path the starting points towards more future dialogues and exchanges among Buddhist scholars of the Pali and Sanskrit tradition. With this today, I'll wrap up the session and see you all at the technical session this afternoon and tomorrow. Thank you, Your Holiness. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Your Holiness. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye, Your Holiness. See you soon. It was sort of draw, draw, show. Dear brothers and sisters, thank you so much uh, for joining us the morning inaugural session. So now we will break off for a lunch break. We will come back onto this same virtual room at 1 p.m. India Standard Time. And please do not lock out from this virtual room. We will leave this room open throughout and we will start promptly at 1 p.m. India's time. So in the event you have locked out of this room, not to worry, we are using the same meeting ID and passcode as you can see on this screen. So if you like, you can take a picture of this uh, meeting ID and passcode. So if your system happened to lock out of this virtual room, you can join us back later. So we look forward to see everyone punctually at 1 p.m. India time to start the next session. Thank you very much. Enjoy your lunch.